You're listening to Relatable with Stephanie Michelle, only on LA Talk Radio. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Relatable. I'm your host, Stephanie Michelle. It's the kickoff to the holidays. You know, Thanksgiving is just a couple days away, and we're going to talk about that. Um, We're going to have a pretty somber talk today, but I'm really looking forward to talking to my guest, Dr. Angelique Campton, about the opioid epidemic. But first, Thanksgiving. Let's talk about Thanksgiving. So if there's one thing that I think that families and friends need across America right now, it's a meaningful Thanksgiving. And what I mean by that is meaningful in terms of just connecting with each other and feeling loved and feeling understood. What do you believe or what do you think may be standing in the way of having that in your own family? Some will say that it's old family wounds or feuds and of course we all have those in some way shape or form but I believe there's a bigger culprit at play this year. No matter how much time you spend online you've probably come across some information that has caused you stress or you've participated in a social media comment stream that has frustrated you when it went terribly south very quickly. These, there are two types of, of communications that, are, that we're using online that are spilling over into our offline communication. This quick sound biting, like uh, debating is one of them, and of course straight up gossip. Both of these forms of communication are just fast food relating. They're not providing us any relational nourishment, and I want them to stop. <laughs> so I don't want this to spill over during Thanksgiving, and I believe that we can do better. And what we first just have to acknowledge that that is the culprit. So what happens when a communicator does not feel that their message was heard, they keep communicating. So if we've had a tough conversation online and you didn't feel heard or understood, then that intensity and that anxiety gets taken with you when you try to have this conversation offline. And it's just not productive, it's so stressful, and it's not working for anybody. So I think the first thing that we need to think about when we get together over Thanksgiving is like, look, having those types of conversation where we're just like spewing sound bites is not going to change anybody's mind. What changes people's mind is when we learn about each other and we lean into like, well, why do you believe that? And when we actually listen and we look for meaning and we look for understanding. So we need more of that and less of the other stuff uh, for Thanksgiving. And what I suggest in order for us to get there is um, you know, let's just take a break from that type of communication and just set the intention for a meaningful Thanksgiving. And this might mean that you have to reach out to family members and just say, hey, like I want us to feel connected this year. I know there's some hot political topics. Let, let's either not have them, or if we have them, have them in a structure. And I'm going to talk about what that is in just a minute. Um, and then build in a lot of safe communication in your event. Okay? And here's what I mean by safe communication. Um, safe communication can be like telling everybody to bring a, a meal that, or, or a, dish, a side dish that has a story behind it, or a game that they love playing, and they can tell a story about the first time that they played. Even better, wear something that has a story behind it. So it's kind of like, oh, this has a special bonus, you know, memory to it. And talk about that when you get to your event. Like, have all that fun, safe communication in there. You can also have, you know, the table topic box that I use here that has fun, silly questions in, just to help have questions out there that are meant to get a conversation going where we're learning about each other and we're not quick debating. Um, My favorite thing, favorite, favorite, favorite thing for Thanksgiving that I hope all families just try to do is let's lean into gratefulness and game it a little bit. And what I mean by that is when you're sitting at the dinner table and everybody shares something that they're grateful for, actually count it out and time it. So the first person would go, one, Aunt Barb's uh, dessert. The next person says, two, my health. And you just keep going. After 60 seconds, find out how many things were shared because you just keep going around. 
and either do it again at the end of the event, like after dessert, and see if you can beat your own record, or write it down and do it next year to see if like you, there's more things to be grateful for. Like my family's pretty competitive, so I know that that you know we would have fun with this, and <laughs> I encourage everybody to do that. But why like sharing what what you're grateful for is like people's values and beliefs are revealed when you share something that you're great, something that's meaningful and, and um, something that you're grateful for. So there's an opportunity for us to learn about each other, and you might learn something new about your aunt or your uncle or your grandmother in that quick you know, round of gratefulness. So I suggest that. If you are going to try to tackle some of the tough topics, um, especially the political ones in the air, this is what I suggest. Just put a little structure around that format and make sure when you're done with it, go back to safe communication. So go play a game, do some gratefulness or whatever. But this is the structure that I recommend. Let everybody put a topic in a hat, and dr somebody draws you know, which topic you're going to talk about first. Sit in a circle, and let everybody share what they think about that particular topic. And I like circles, because then people know that, hey, their term's coming up, and they're less likely to step on somebody when they're trying to talk. And you know, it just it allows everybody to get to say something. Now, as things are shared, people are going to start going, oh, that's not how I feel, or you're wrong. Um, avoid that. Avoid any conversation that's going to put somebody on the defense. And instead go, why do you feel that way? Tell me more. Where did you find that, that out? Well, this is what I know. Um, there's a practice in communication called mirroring, which is basically just repeating what the other person said. But in doing that, you can slow down a little bit. So if you're feeling like really anxious, before you say what you need to say, go, OK, I just want to make sure that I got everything that you said. So you had this experience, and you learned this information. Did I get all that right? Is there anything that I'm missing? You know, so that slows down your reaction time before you go and go, blah, 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 this is how I feel. So I recommend trying that if you're going to you know, try to have these conversations. And when someone does get a little heated, you know, gets, gets frustrated or you know, um, starts to get angry about the conversation, because there's definitely a lot of stuff out there that's making us angry, um, what I have found that is when a communicator is saying something and they haven't felt like someone heard them yet, they continue to say it and they d deliver it more fiercely as they, as they feel nobody's understanding or getting the information. So they're not going to stop communicating until they know that the message is received. So when someone's really frustrated, you know, a safe touch, a touch on the arm, some eye contact and say, I can understand how you can feel that way and I really appreciate you saying that. I understand that, why you can have that perspective. Now, notice, we don't, I don't, I'm not saying I agree and empathy is not endorsement, but I'm just letting this person know that the message, I heard them, you know, and that usually will diffuse that. And if it still is tough, you know, maybe it's time to table that topic and pull another one out of the hat. So this is all. And I'm, I forgot to mention, when you do sit down to have tough conversations, just have an agreement that, hey, we are all going to respect and love each other when this is over. We don't have to agree, but we're still going to respect each other and love each other. We're a family. So if you do that, this is what I recommend. Um, the goal here, of course, is more conversation for understanding and not per persuasion. Keep in mind, all of the conversations and all the communication online is selling something, whether it's selling you to believe something or selling you a product. It's 24-hour selling cycle. And we don't like that as people. Like, we don't want to be sold to all the time. We need a break from this. So when we get together with, you, with each other over the holidays, stop selling. <laughs> Just stop. You know, listen, ask questions. This is a great time to pull out the why questions. You know, why do you feel this way? What's important to you? Why is that important to you? And really get to know your family and connect with them. That's my wish. So we're going to lean into love for Thanksgiving. With this loving intention, I also learned that my guest is celebrating a birthday. And so um, I hope you like red velvet cupcakes. Oh, I love them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. You're That's welcome. very sweet. You're Thank welcome. You. I figured it was a safe bet. Because <laughs> glam ER doctor, red velvet, they sort of Perfect. go hand in hand. So Perfect. let's learn about you so we can talk to you about our topic today. So this is Dr. Angelique Campton. She is an MD and board certified emergency medicine physician. In her career, she has served as a medical director for Burbank Emergency Medical Group at Providence St. Johnson, St. Joseph Medical Center, as well as the clinical instructor of emergency medicine at UCLA. Dr. Campton completed her residency in emergency medicine at UCLA 
Olive View UCLA residence program and served as chief resident there in her final year. She holds an MBA in healthcare management, is a fellow at the American College of Emergency Physicians, served on the wellness committee for American Colleges, College of Emergency Physicians, as well as a board member for Prominent St. Joseph's Foundation. So much and there's still more, <laughs> it's so impressive. Her, she volunteers her medical services at the LA Free Clinic, owns an aesthetic medical medicine practice and lectures on delivering bad news, oh yeah, and how to keep yourself safe in a medical arena. Her latest passion is educating patients and helping, helping them solve the opioid epidemic in healthcare. She is the proud mother of 13-year-old twins and 11-year-old. Welcome. Thank Happy you. birthday. Thank you. So glad that you're here. Thank you. It's a tough topic, but I'm glad I think that we can handle this with some love and, you know, encouragement and solutions and definitely. Yeah. Thank it's really important. So thank you for for seeing that this is such an important topic and and highlighting it. Awesome. Well, so Every person that sits in this chair, I always ask before we get into the topic, is there anything that you just want to clear out that might be distracting you or pulling, <laughs> pulling your attention? Just you want to put it out there so we can dive in? I think you already did. It's my birthday. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, I need to know. I need people to know it's my birthday. And special plans today? Um, no, nothing in particular. Just to be grateful for another round around the sun for me. So. Yeah, I like it. I, I mean, it's the season of gratefulness, so we can lean into that. Well, so let's um, let's start from the beginning a little bit. When did you know you wanted to be a doctor? It's a funny question. No one in my family is a physician. It's not like I had a chronic illness and spent a lot of time in the hospital. I always wanted to know what was inside. So much to my mother's horror, if my goldfish would die, oh. take it in the kitchen and cut oh, it open and things like that. Yeah. So I was either going to be some horrible murderer <laughs> or a doctor. I'm glad so. you said the later. <laughs> I think my parents steered me in the right direction. Did you have the game operation when of you were a kid? Of course I did. You did? Of course I did. <laughs> were you really good about getting it out before it? Oh, I practiced for hours. I'm not <laughs> kidding. No. That's awesome. Um, so why, e why ER doctor? Like, why did you pick that over all the doctors you could be? Yeah, so, f so for years when I said I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to be a surgeon. Mm -hmm. I, I loved the blood and the guts and what mm -hmm. was inside and the gore. And then I did a rotation in emergency medicine mm -hmm. and just fell in love with it. it. Obviously because, you know, you see all this cool stuff. It's fast paced, it's academic, you're constantly learning. You know, anything you can dream of, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. But I've been doing it for quite some time. And um, I think what I didn't realize about emergency medicine that I love and what keeps me doing it is I really get to see the most intimate times in mm -hmm. people's lives. When they're scared, when they're hurting, when they're uh, relieved. Um, and it's that that really makes it a unique practice of medicine. And I feel so lucky every day I go to work that I get to help people in that time. Mm -hmm. it, what comes up for me when you share that, it's almost like you're getting a glimpse of humanity as a whole, like because people are really vulnerable in emergency situations. And you're seeing the family members interact with each other. And you're kind of seeing the stuff that matters, it feels like, in terms of life or death situation. Exactly. Exactly. From from anything, from the real urgent traumas, mm -hmm. gunshot wounds, stabbings, you know, the, those things, to even the little things. Mm -hmm. uh, someone has a sore throat and they're afraid that they have cancer. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it runs the whole gamut. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so I, let's just go to the topic that we're going to talk about. Um, so we definitely are hearing more about opioids, um, both from media and from politicians. Um, it's been in the news a lot. You know, there's a problem. They point to certain states. Um, what? Where do you feel like some of this information is right first? Like, what, what's out there? Just kind of address the information that's out there and where you think, okay, that's part of it. That's that's certainly true. Well, I'm really glad that it's a hot topic right mm -hmm. now because it really has become a huge issue. Just as a little example, 
uh, prescriptions for narcotics has quadrupled from the year 2000. Has our pain quadrupled? <laughs> no. So along with that, deaths from narcotic pain medications mm -hmm. have also quadrupled. Mm -hmm. So if that gives you any, any insight into whether we really needed those extra narcotics or not. So I'm, I think that the, that the media and politics and, and everything has gotten it right by highlighting this issue, that it is, it is a problem, it is a problem that we need to fix and then look at prevention. Mm -hmm. um, so you're glad they're talking about it. So this is the first step. What, what are they not talking about that you wish was more public knowledge? Well, I think a lot of what has not been mentioned is kind of how this came about. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot. There's a lot of finger pointing at, um, you know, addictive personalities or drug-seeking behavior or bad doctors. But I think I think there's a shared responsibility mm -hmm. in why this became a problem. So um, back in the '90s, back. <laughs> um, when I was first starting uh, my practice, it was the push was that doctors weren't treating enough pain. In fact, there was a saying in medicine that pain was the fifth vital sign. Hmm. So I think that was kind of the, s the start of, of the problem. Mm -hmm. There was really a push to, to, to treat pain which I totally agree with. Nobody should suffer. Mm -hmm. But I think the problem came about. Can I ask mm -hmm. you what it was before that? So if they, if, if, it, if in the 90s they're saying, okay, let's treat the pain, what was there going to, uh, let's ignore the pain? Or like, what was the, the difference before that? Where did it come from? Um, I think there was more of a, of a hesitation to give stronger pain medicines um, before we made a complete, complete 180 turnaround. Okay. So, um, so I do think that there was a little bit of undertreatment of pain. It also, you know, we became a, a society, everything in our society became more, you know, faster. I want it now. I want, I want the answer now. I want the treatment now. Mm -hmm. So I think treating pain became part of that mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and a big in my opinion, a big culprit for this problem was the FDA approval of a particular pain medicine called OxyContin. Mm -hmm. Now, OxyContin was marketed as a long-acting drug that was going to uh, prevent a lot of abuse of pain medicines because the normal ones we were using, Vicodin, Norco, Tylenol with codeine, are dosed every six hours, whereas mm -hmm. OxyContin was touted that it was every 12 hours. Okay. So um, in about 2000, hundreds of millions of dollars were, once it was approved, was, was put into the marketing of this medication, and it became more and more mainstream to use it. Unfortunately, we now know that OxyContin is only effective for eight hours. So rather than increase the frequency of this medicine, mm -hmm. Um, the drug company decided to say you needed to use higher doses, which really only contributed to addiction. Um, so that's that's one small piece of the puzzle, but I think it had a big impact. So they kind of pushed instead of going taking it more at the same dosage, they p they just pushed out very quickly a higher dosage. Exactly, exactly. Um, and uh, at the same time, um, uh, focus was changing, like I said, on treatment of pain. Mm -hmm. And I think um, bureaucracy, or, or however you want to call it, tried to get doctors to treat pain in a non-clinical way. For example, when you go to the emergency department, mm -hmm. you get a survey of how your how your care was, which I think is very important. Um, but in that survey, they ask about the treatment of your pain and so forth. 
That survey is then tied to hospital reimbursements. Well, when the hospital doesn't get reimbursed, the physicians are at risk, and um, it just starts a big cascade. So there's a lot of pressure on you to keep your patients happy, and I think that a lot of doctors started just being pill pushers mm -hmm. at that point. I don't know when it happened, but we started using big gun narcotic medications for smaller pain problems. Mm -hmm. So for example, you would go to the you, uh, for headache, um, sprained ankle, uh, scratch on your <laughs> cornea, um, things that, that can be treated in very different ways. The knee-jerk response was, well, here's some Vicodin, here's some Norco. Every um, small issue got narcotic pain medicine. Um, and I think we forgot about all the conservative ways to treat pain, anti-inflammatories, non-narcotic pain medicines, simple things like ice and massage. <laughs> you know, doctors stopped talking about those kinds yeah. of things and just started giving medicine. And, and like you were saying earlier, they could have been encouraged to do that because everybody, you know, any business wants good reviews, right? So if people were filling out the survey and saying, oh, they didn't do a good job of treating my pain, so then some executive order, some note memo goes out to all the doctors saying, do better at treating pain. And without any other conversation about it, it's like, well, here's the drug on the shelf. Like, mm -hmm. we'll just give them more of that. It's very easy, very easy to just write a prescription. In fact, um, in 2016, I think the, the statistic is a half a billion prescriptions for narcotics were written. That's enough for every American to have a bottle of narcotic pain pills in mm -hmm. their house. A lot. That's a lot. So, is there? Um, so, this is definitely part of the problem. So, this is where we kind of we we started with it. Um, do you? Let's talk a little bit about your experiences in the ER with this. So, just firsthand experiences where you're like, "Wow, we've got to do something about this." Things that you can share. Obviously, you can't. Right. Right. Go into too many so, details, but you know, I kind of already talked about. Um, the culture of just giving narcotics for for lesser painful situations. Any 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 pain just gets a narcotic pain pill. So you're seeing it from the doc. So we talked about from the doctor standpoint of what the doctor's role and maybe the mm -hmm. situation is. What about um, maybe seeing um, a person coming in asking for it? I guess that's probably a situation. Or so this is a very very common thing in the emergency department. Um, when someone is, has, is addicted now mm -hmm. to narcotics and has run out, where do they go? They go to the emergency department very often. And um, it's, it's you know, pain is a very subjective thing, so it, it's, very, it's very easy to feign pain and to ask for pain medicine. and. It was very easy before when the focus is on treating pain to just give additional medications. Mm -hmm. Now, um, fortunately, it's a controlled substance and there's actually a website that every doctor um, has a login for where we can see how many narcotic pain prescriptions you've filled. Um, so that's been a very useful tool for us. But at that point, so let's, I'm just gonna go mm -hmm. hypothetical. Um, so someone comes in and maybe they're inventing pain or they're kind of faking pain because they're addicted. And um, they're, they may know you're gonna go look it up and see that you, know, you can't really give them anything because they've been given too much. Um, what's some of the next steps to, like, to treat this person now that has an addiction? Like what's that protocol look like? That's a really, really important um, problem to solve. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I have the answer mm -hmm. for that. Um, because th this is a little bit shocking. Um, they say about 75% of heroin addicts started with prescription narcotics. Wow. That's, that's huge. Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I first learned that, I, I didn't believe it, but it's, it's a statistic that's repeated over and over. Um, and, and that is a fear of mine is that when, when people do come to the ER looking for more narcotics and they're not given that or they're, they're ad addicted and then they're cut off by their doctor, 
then they do turn to street drugs to to relieve that um, that pain. Um, and the things that we have in place now, um, a lot of people talk about methadone is is one of the biggest. Um, another drug. It's another drug. Methadone is a a narcotic that is supposed to have a no euphoric aspect. Mm -hmm. So it takes away that withdrawal symptom. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a great drug as a bridge. It's supposed to be used as a bridge to get you off of the the narcotic pain medication. Unfortunately, it has become just a substitute now. And um, there are methadone clinics all over the, the city, this, our country, where people just go for years and just continue to get their methadone. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that that, I think that needs to change. Um, there, there's something that I, that came up for me when you're talking. So the, the, we hear the terms cut out a lot when we, like when someone has definitely um, exhibited signs that they are addicted and they're just coming for the pills. And so the language turns to, we have to cut them off. And um, I don't have the solution either, but like right there, there's, there's some opportunity. It's like, well, of course now this person that's been cut off feels they have nowhere to go and this mm -hmm. is where they go to the street to get the street drugs so somewhere in here and then or, or they either get the street drugs or they get another drug but without treatment and, a, and another place that they can go in the system this their only alternative is to go to the streets so the like the idea you know I don't I can imagine like uh, the you know the doctor is not the, the doctors that are treating pain are not addiction specialists so they're not equipped. They probably don't go through any training. Am I right on, on addiction or maybe identifying it? But it's very true. Um, I think that the education that physicians get right now um, with pain control, identifying addiction, um, more of that needs to happen. Um, it's, it, we definitely lack that. Um, it is a whole specialty in and of itself. So. You're right. The people that are are there, tr starting to identify, or that the the patients come to, are not the ones that are specialists in treatment. Yeah. And it's it's a really difficult disease, addiction. Um, you know, there's such a, a recidivism to get back on the drugs that, you know, it. I, I don't have the solution yeah. for that, um, but I, I do think it highlights preventing it in the first place yeah. using the narcotic there are narcotic pain medications that have less euphoria they don't make you feel high and they treat pain um, so why aren't why those should used we more? not be using yeah why don't we, we know about those? those we don't so we as the consumer don't even know those by name which is part of the problem because now we have a situation where every third commercial is a prescription drug commercial you can go in and ask for it which I think is a little weird like I shouldn't, as a consumer, go in to ask you, a professional in the medical field, what drug I should be put on. Like it's it's a little bizarre. It, it has been very interesting practicing medicine both before the internet and after. <laughs> yeah. Because it's really changed the role of the patient. Patients yeah. do come in asking. So I think conversations like this are really good to educate the the public about about the risks of medications because they are so common everybody knows what vicodin is everybody knows what percocet is it doesn't sound scary or dangerous yet yet it is one in four people that take just those two medicines which are not even the high risk addictive mm -hmm. ones will will develop some sort of an addiction it mm -hmm. may be very short acting but it's that euphoria that it gives you that that makes you want to take it more yeah is part, um, in your opinion, I know we're, we're not going to come up with all the solutions here today, um, is part of the problem maybe that uh, the medical field in general needs to lean into some more holistic or like healthy food sort of talk, um, whole body treatment. To, so there are all the alternatives, all the things that you can do in a wellness situation are put out to the patient so they can make better decisions. I mean, is, what do you feel about that? Most definitely. That's a, that's a huge thing. Rather than 
just going to, you know, encouraging the pill popping society to talk about using, um, you know, heat and ice and massage and, and uh, you know, using your brain to, to try to focus on, uh, if you think about it, even with childbirth, mm -hmm. it has changed with that too. We've mm -hmm. gone away from like the Lamas and pain control with that way to just, okay, give me the epidural, give me the drugs. Yeah. Um, so I think I think we need to get back to a happy medium between the two. I, I, one of the issues that I talk about all the time here, from more of a relational communication standpoint, is just the the fastness of everything. And you talked about it a little bit earlier, you know, the opportunity to just slow down and thoroughly have a conversation. I can't remember the last time. I don't get sick very often, and I hate going to the doctor or any kind of hospital or anything. It's just not. So I don't know if anybody loves it, but it's just not my thing. I get a little, I get even more sick sometimes knowing that I have to go. And um, the the interaction is so impersonal. And like, you know, the questions that are asked at the beginning of, of just a health checkup. Like, you don't need to know how many tons I'm having inside. You know, like mm -hmm. it's like it's a little it's a it's a lot. It's intense. And then and then just the quick like, okay, take your blood pressure, or have your pap smear, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and then boop, you're done. And the next person's coming in. So I just I like to think that part of the solution is just slowing down the system a little bit, like having more of a conversation with your doctor, being able to maybe we as as patients need to be trained to be a better patient, and the and the doctors need to be trained to communicate the bedside manner a little bit more. But the slowing down, like to me, there's some solutions in there so that we're not making quick decisions on what pill to take. Oh goodness, you've opened a whole Pandora's box <laughs> yeah, with that. If I if I could slow down in the emergency department, you can't in the emergency. Yeah. So I, that it, it's not just the emergency department. Think about your primary care doctor that has patients scheduled every 20 minutes, yeah. and um, more and more stress is being put on physicians to do more um, with less that I think that's another part of the problem is people come in and the easy thing is just to say okay what do you want you want a pain medicine here you want a pill here you want an antibiotic here rather than taking the time to talk to a patient and educate them over and over in my day, I find myself saying to patients, you know, the easy thing for me to do would be just to write you a, a pill for that or mm -hmm. an antibiotic mm -hmm. for the cold you have, but that's the wrong thing to do. So I'm gonna, the, I'm gonna sit here and talk to mm -hmm. you and tell you why you don't need that. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that more doctors start to do that. Um, but what you're talking about or what I'm alluding to is like there's a bigger, Thing at play there's funding there's liability there's like there's all kinds of pressures that even the physician has on them to um maybe hit a quote it's not a quota but like you know you be efficient so serve this many patients and um you're going to get reviewed by that if someone waited too long and quick 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 and you know so there's a lot of um you lot hit of the nail on the <laughs> head that's it's exactly it there are so many pieces that go into this that are that are interlocked um so knowing that, so that's a system, that's a culture, that's an infrastructure. So I kind of lean back to maybe the, you know, where some emphasis in the solution should be is on us, the patient, the consumer, of knowing how to talk to a physician, ask questions. I mean, you're not going to leave the room if I'm still asking questions, right? That's for sure. Yeah, if I'm asking questions, you're going to go, okay, well, this is what I know about this drug, or this is why I don't think you should, should be put on this, because here's your, I'm looking at your charts, and, you know, you're, but yeah, I try to educate um, friends, family, that that's um, when you mentioned in, in your intro about that one of my passions is educate the people how to be safe in the medical arena. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of it falls on the patient mm -hmm. themselves um, to be prepared to ask the right questions. So a few little things, little tips I'll give you. So, awesome. Um, when uh, when it, it's obvious that your doctor is in a hurry, um, invite them to sit down. So 
now you have them as a captive audience. So that's something that I actually make sure I do with my patients mm-hmm. is sit down so that they know I'm focused on them, I don't seem rushed, and so forth. But if, if your doctor hasn't done that, invite them to sit yeah, down. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> um, and also just to, to take some responsibility for your own health care. Um, it's amazing to me that people will research more um, about the painter for their home <laughs> than they will for their primary care doctor. Mm-hmm. So if you find that you're going to a doctor that's just a, a pill pusher or not, not talking to you, not listening to you, then find another doctor. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you sh- if, if there's anybody you have a good relationship with, it should be the, the people that are caring for your body, your, your most important thing that you own, essentially, right? This is it, better than a car. Get you places. Exactly. Um, all right. Well, I like that being part of, you know, we can encourage people to just be a b- better patient. Um, I don't think that necessarily means research a bunch of drugs online. Um, I think that sit, I think that means like maybe having some prepared questions about what is important to my health. What should I reveal? You know, um, am I worried that I have a kind of a, an addictive personality? I'll eat a whole bag of chips or, you know, I'm like I do things or it runs in my family, whatever it is. But I don't think there's a situation of oversharing when it comes to a patient. Like, you know, I need you to know this so we can make the best decisions together about my health care. to ask all the, your questions, um, you shouldn't ever be shy or it, when you're, when you're in a, a medical arena, that is not the time to be your doctor's favorite patient. <laughs> it's the time for you to get the best treatment that you need and to be your best advocate. Yeah. So to ask the risks of any medication that you're given. So if you're given a pain medication, to ask, well, how do I know if, uh, you know, ha- what are the side effects of this? How do I know I'm not getting addicted to it? Uh, how long can I take this? Mm-hmm. Things like that. Just to ask and be, be aware of everything that you're putting in your body. Yeah. And, and if you are a shy person, <laughs> you know, let's say the doctor's super hot and McDreamy, you know, and you don't want to ask the questions, there's always a nurse around. Or there's always somebody else that you can lean into, right? To, you know, like, don't think that, if you're feeling intimidated but you really want to ask a question, find somebody that you're not feeling intimidation with and just ask, and they can go talk to that person. I'm sure that that's okay, right? That's, you know? that's exactly right. I mean, that's exactly right. Not that we're lucky enough to get a victory, <laughs> but it might happen. Um, all right, I like that. I like that, you know, just kind of taking some responsibility um, beforehand. I mean, really, this is like preventative, it, it's kind of looking at it before it's a problem. We know that there's a breakdown after someone has become addicted and then they're getting that cut off and now they're going somewhere and there's the opportunity for so much there, so much system there, but you know, you and I are not going to be able to, to do that. And part of that is to the person, even if I, the doctor, you, the doctor, uh, me, the doctor, that's a scary thought, you, the doctor, can identify or can see the signs of addiction, but the person might not be willing to accept that yet. So there's that whole thing. Like you can give them the literature, you can give them the warnings, you can have a conversation and you can tell them some places to go. But once they're there, like that's something that they're gonna have to decide to make a decision to go and, and, and seek out help. That's right, that's, that's part of what makes it so difficult to treat such a difficult disease to treat Yeah. Um, is the, the patient themselves has to realize it there's, and have buy-in. There's stigma around it. Like, you want to get treated for cancer. You don't really necessarily want to get treated and get labeled as an addict. Exactly. Uh, so it's, it's and you mentioned before about, well, I have an addictive personality. That's one thing with, with pain medicines. It, it actually can happen to anyone. It's not selective, it's, is it? It's yeah. not just that, you know, I have alcoholism in my family or I'm an addictive personality. It really can happen to anyone and it is so easy to happen that I think that's part of the problem is that people think oh no I'm not addicted to this I I, I have pain so I'm taking it I have pain and then people don't realize that they are creating their pain by they're really not having pain anymore they're just feeling the withdrawal well (laughs) I feel I'm so glad that you said that I feel like um and there's some studies around here but I don't have any numbers to put out right at this moment but I feel like we live in a situation now in a culture that 
is more anxious. Like the, this online communication is destroying us. I mean, it is destroying our ability to be well with each other. And so there's a lot of things that we're carrying. We carry them into different conversations. We carry them into relationships. And so, and then we kind of deal with it. We put a little Band-Aid on the open wound and we kind of deal with it. And then God forbid you get in a car accident and now you've been prescribed a pain medication and you get to tune out for a minute. And all, of, like, you didn't have a solution for dealing with that stuff before, but now this, like, tune-out drug is like, oh, yeah, I don't have to feel that anymore. And I think that's happening, too. I think just culturally, there's so much trauma in the news and the media that, and we, we're not meant to process information as fast as we're having to, and we're not able to sit down and slow down and talk and go, God, I need to really work out how I feel about this. So that's there's a, good point. there's a perfect <laughs> storm that's for, a- like, I just got this opportunity to sort of tune out now and I'm going to lean into it. This feels really nice. I like feeling high, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the problem, too. That's a really good point that I hadn't realized. Um, There's one thing that I do want to bring up, though, is everything I'm talking about, like when I started saying that, you know, we're using these medicines for for the less serious pain, for the ankle sprains Mm -hmm. and so forth, I am not talking about cancer pain. you know, post-surgical pain, um, you know, after serious accidents. And there are, there are, um, you know, diseases that have chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I, I also don't want us after, after hopefully we do find a solution and, and change physician and and patients' minds about the use of narcotics to go in the other direction and go back to, being a little bit stingy with pain medicine yeah. it's just finding that balance yeah it's we have to do a better job of, identi- of uh, looking at context right like a really like here's all the situations and it, just because it's wrong over here doesn't mean we wipe it off all over here like and this to me is again is an opportunity to slow down like you can't make one decision over here and not look at the 12 other places that that decision with those sets of variables need to be determined you know and looked at as well so very hard to slow down in medicine yeah I mean the whole the whole theme of I I can't tell you what the next breakthrough will be Mm -hmm. you know in medicine but I will tell you it's going to be something that's faster closer you know that's the whole theme of medicine is treating infection faster treating heart attack faster treating stroke faster so it is a a good reminder that for some things you need to slow down Mm -hmm. And maybe just the patient asking the <laughs> questions before you get into that that fast process. Is there anything else that you want to share on this topic before we switch gears? I think we did a. I think we have covered. We it. think we covered it. All right. Well, so at this time in the show, I like to just demonstrate that any given time, we, uh, the circumstances of how we're relating can change, and and to show that there's always more information available. So. We know what you do, we know about some of the things you know about, but we don't know totally about you. And how <laughs> you're like, oh! Um, and how I like to play around with this. So you get to choose a question from the box or the Ooh, book. Ooh, goody. Let's do the box. The box, okay. This is called Not Your Mama's Table, to- or Not Your Mama's Dinner Party. So they're ca- they tend to be silly. So let's go in All here. Right. All right. What does the opposing political party do better than yours? <laughs> Oh Didn't no! Well, Isn't the whole point of this not to talk no, about this? <laughs> no. Sometimes we have to go there. We're not um, fighting yet, so we're good. Um, let's see. I would say. Um, oh, but then this is going to give a clue into my political party. Um, <laughs> you could just say it and just leave it at that and let people uh, guess. On I uh, being um, inclusive. Inclusive. Let's okay. It it's a mystery answer. We can all try to figure out what it means. I'm going to give you another one. Because, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, can you do weird tricks with your face or body? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> what, how would your kids answer this? <laughs> even, even better. Oh, my goodness. Um, they would say that I make funny faces <laughs> with my... Oh, I can make weird lines with my, with my mouth. Um, but I can also do a lot of things without my feet touching the ground. I used to be a gymnast, so oh, I can do a lot of things on my hands. Did not know that. <laughs> did not know. See, we're learning already. All right. I feel like we just have to kill one more. Okay. One more. <laughs> Let's see. No, 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 no. 
Is it better to stay married for the kids? (laughs) (laughs) No, because I think it's better for kids to uh, understand true passion and happiness and love. I would kind of agree with that. I'd want my kids to have an example of loving relationships and things working and not see, you know, not be so hyper-focused on what's not working. And if you're staying together for the kids, there's probably going to be a lot of that. I tend to agree with that one. All right. See, we learned some Ooh, stuff. Those yeah, questions you know, like, were harder than the than Sometimes the, the box has a mind of its own and it just stays on, like, <laughs> sex topics, which are a lot of fun. <laughs> that would have been easier. It would have been easier? <laughs> oh, see, we have to have you back. All right. Um, so the last thing that we do on the show is what I call Heartswell. And the reason um, that we do Heartswell, well, well, first, here's what a Heartswell is. So Heartswell is just giving a shout out to someone that, you know, that you're thinking about that just deserves some kind words or some acknowledgement or a tribute. Um, it just, you just something that you want to say like, hey, I see you, I hear you, and you mean something to me. Um, I like doing it because I like to show that expressing deep emotions or feelings towards people shouldn't be so scary. We should do it more. Um, we all need to hear these things more. So I just like to give everybody an opportunity to both do that and then experience that. Does someone come to mind? Yes, but okay. I actually have two. Okay. So. Um, during all this talking, I, um, I do want to give a shout out to the team that I work with in the ER because everything we talked about is so familiar to them and, and we deal with this day in and day out and it's really hard to, um, to manage it and to, to keep up with that, that speed and that trying to get to everyone and still give the patients the time and empathy that we just kind of talked about. And the team that I work with in the emergency department really knows how to do that. Mm-hmm. And so thank you, all of you guys, for you know who everything you, are. you do. <laughs> um, and uh, being my birthday, I do want to give out a shout to Mr. T. So sorry that you can't be here to support me right now in this room. Um, but thank you for all the support and love that you give me um, and helping me do what I do in my life. <laughs> That's awesome. To, to work shout out, family <laughs> shout out, you covered the gamut. It's I all did. good. That's, that's, and this, by the way, is an example of how we should be communicating at Thanksgiving. <laughs> like, honestly, just going in with the intention of saying one nice thing to every family member, even the Uncle Bob that starts all the fights. And sorry, Uncle Bob, the Uncle Bobs of the world, because I've been using that example a lot lately. Um, so let me just change it. Uncle Bruce, Uncle, um, I don't know. But it, there's great Uncle Bobs in the world. But going in with the intention of, like, having something nice to say to everybody, I mean, come on. We can do that for, like, an hour for dinner. Like, we need that. We all need this right now, I think. So thank you for sharing that that way and hopefully that encourages other people to think about what heart swells they can get to each other especially over the holidays um so with that being said i really appreciate you being here um if people want to follow you or connect with you which do you have a social media that you so on twitter i have uh, a campin and on social media, I have Glam ER Doc. Oh, I knew it. <laughs> See, that was my, that's why I knew you'd like Red Velvet. Because she said Glam. I'm like, Glam and Red Velvet kind of go hand in hand. And people probably think I'm crazy for thinking that, but it's all right. Perfect. All right. Well, I appreciate you being here. I hope you have a wonderful birthday. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you for dedicating this time to this really important subject. I, I no problem. <laughs> I was happy to do that. So that um, brings us to the end of the show. Um, As always, you know, I'd like to issue a social challenge for everybody to try. And I'm just going to stick with what I said at the beginning of the show, which is go into Thanksgiving with the intention of making it meaningful, meaningful in a way that you feel connected, that you're making an effort to connect with people and give them love. And, you know, the best way to do that, because we're all out of practice, like this is not like a you know, blame somebody in the family because they're the ones that, you know, that make it hard for everybody. Everybody's out of practice when it comes to meaningful connection and having, like, dialogue that feels good rather than just, like, quick debating and and gossip. Like, we kind of fall back on those two things when we don't practice other communication. So um, set the intention. Reach out to people that are coming to your family dinner. Ask them, you know, what would it look like for you if we had more of a meaningful gathering? And 
build in to the sequence of the event some safe communication stuff. So at the beginning, we're talking about the dishes of food that we brought or the game that we're going to play later or the shirt that like was, you know, brings back this memory of this great family vacation. Um, we m might have one of these around so that, you know, when you get stuck, just pull a question out and ask those questions. Do the round of gratefulness game. That to me, like I can't wait to hear from people that are doing that and they get excited about we got up to 60 in 60 seconds it's amazing and then they try to beat their next year's record like um try that you know anything that's not going to put somebody on the defense is safe communication and if you want to go there and if you want to talk out tough topics and believe me i know like i'm carrying trauma of topics right now that i i want to talk to people about with um if you're going to go there do it from a structured situations so sit in a circle everybody takes their turn and they keep sharing and when it gets heated use mirroring just repeat back so what you're saying is did I get that right tell me more where did you find that you know where where did you come across this information or why do you believe this why is this important to you I love why questions I love them I love them I love them this is how we connect with each other when we get to the why behind what we do what we believe and and um, what's important to us so and just putting all that out there, lots of love for Thanksgiving, meaningful connection. Let me know how it goes. If you have a unique situation in your family and you're like, Stephanie, none of that stuff's gonna work. It's just not gonna work and here's the situation, challenge me. I wanna help as many families as I can over the holidays. So I'm at Relate With Steph on Facebook and Instagram and Love More Now, huh? Love More Now, get it? Love More Now on Twitter. So reach out to me and I'll do the best that I can to help you have a meaningful Thanksgiving. So. Happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you next week. As always, just encourage you to relate with more curiosity. Bye. <laughs>